Since beginning this channel two years ago, one system that people have kept requesting for me to review and give a retrospective on time and time again has been the Panasonic 3DO. The issue with reviewing such a system was first procuring a bloody system in the first place, then secondly working my way through a large chunk of the library. So I could actually have the right to form an opinion on the subject that is actually worth listening to in the first place. Now that I have achieved both of these benchmarks, I think it is about time I throw my hat into the 3DO arena. Yeah! At one point in time, 1993 to be exact, the Panasonic Interactive Multiplayer was the most powerful games console in planet Earth's history. The 3DO looked very much like it was the future of gaming and made its competition at the time like the Super Nintendo look like a baby's toy in comparison. So with all this power and potential, why did the 3DO not crush its competition? And more importantly, is the system still worth playing today? Before we get to answering those questions though, we need to look into the system's history. So let's start by going back to the dawn of the 90s. The early 90s was a really, really weird time in gaming. It was the birth of the next so-called generation of gaming platforms to proceed the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive. Today, we often consider the preceding generation of systems to be the Sega Saturn, Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64. But between all of this, there was a plethora of less successful systems being released, such as the Atari Jaguar, the Amiga CD32, the Philips CDI, the Sega Mega CD, the Bandai Pippin, the FM Towns Marty, the Palladia, just to name a few of these bloody buggers. I personally like to think of this as the lost console generation, as these systems seem to sit directly in between two generations of extremely popular systems. In fact, there was so much money lost due to failed console ventures over this period that some even consider this period to be the era of the second video game crash. There were bloody consoles everywhere you turned, so with the console market being completely oversaturated, does this mean the 3DO is overlooked and underrated somewhat as a result? Well, perhaps, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves yet. The 3DO was originally conceived by the 3DO company, which was founded way back in 1991 by a gentleman known as Trip Hawkins, the same corporate villain who funded a little company known as EA, aka Electronic Arts, the same company who were famous for tricking people into making microtransactions and convincing stupid idiots to buy the exact same sports games year in and year out at premium prices. Trip's inspiration for wanting to create a games console himself started in 1990, just after he had made a breakthrough deal with Sega, which he knew would fuel EA's growth as a company exponentially. Trip could only foresee growth from this deal though to continue up until 1994, and was concerned with hardware companies lacking initiative, innovation and becoming complacent with their hardware over time. To trip, games consoles of the period were grossly underpowered. The Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo both offered poor graphics and lacked optical disc storage mediums. So to combat this problem, Trip Hawkins' goal was to create a next-gen CD-based video game entertainment standard, which would be manufactured by various partners and licensees. The business model for the 3DO was to be for the company to collect a royalty on each console sold and on each game manufactured. Another business strategy that set the 3DO apart was the attractive offer in which the company offered game publishers to come and develop games for the system. At this period in time, Nintendo and Sega were both ripping off publishers by charging large royalty rates to allow developers to make games for the platforms. 
the 3DO company only wanted a mere $3 cut on every game sold on the system. In terms of the hardware itself, Trip Hawkins set the legendary duo of Dave Needle and RJ McCow with the task with the designing of this hardware. If you have watched previous content on my channel, these names may be familiar to you as the men who designed both the Commodore Amiga 1000 and the Atari Lynx. These two are like the Gunpei Yokoi's of odd hipster gaming platforms, yeah. The 3DO company lacked the resources themselves to manufacture consoles and instead licensed the hardware to other companies for manufacturing. Trip Hawkins recounted that they approached every electronic manufacturer but his main targets of interest were Japanese technology giants such as Sony and Panasonic, the largest electronic companies on the whole of planet Earth. The pitch to Sony obviously didn't get very far, since as we are all aware, they were too busy designing the PlayStation and getting ready to kick Nintendo's ass. Further from this, according to the American Sega CEO at the time, Tom Kalinske, the 3DO company was engaged in very serious talks for Sega to release the 3DO as well. However, it was passed on by Sega due to concerns over costs. As we all know though, the Panasonic deal did go through, as they are perhaps the most famous manufacturer of 3DO platforms. Panasonic launched a 3DO with the FZ1 model in 1993 the very system you can see me holding in my hands right now. Later, other companies would go on to manufacture 3DOs too, such as Goldstar and Sanyo. It is also of note that Samsung, Toshiba and AT&T obtained the rights to make 3DOs too. However, none of these companies chose to ultimately bring the system to the market. Although AT&T did show off a prototype model at the January 1994 Consumer Electronics Show. Hmm, I wonder what stupid price that unique system is worth now. Anyway, all of these cunning plans came into fruition in October of 1993 with the launch of the Panasonic 3DO. The platform received a large amount of attention and was billed to launch with Return Fire, Road Rash, FIFA and Jurassic Park to be some of the games amongst their star-studded launch lineup. Sadly though, all of these games got delayed on the system and never saw releases on the platform until 1994. This was said to be caused by developers reportedly struggling with creating games for such advanced hardware. However, realistically these delays were partially caused by the 3DO company continuing to tweak and update their hardware almost up until the bloody system's launch day. By the time the 3DO came out, sadly only one game was ready for the console's launch, ironically named Crash and Burn, which is a hilariously named launch game considering what we know about the platform's history today. Further to the lack of games, Panasonic pulled the Nintendo and failed to manufacture an ample amount of consoles for the launch too. Reportedly, most retail stores only received one to two units each day. So the absolutely dreadful launch was the first of many problems for the Panasonic 3DO. The cheap $3 royalty fee may have perhaps been the console's biggest mistake of all though. Now let me do my best American impression and see what Trip Hawkins had to say. Ironically, software companies did not really appreciate the generously low licensing fees. Firstly, they claimed that the licensing fees were still too high and they jumped into bed with Sony and Sega immediately and agreed to pay fees that were three times higher to them. Software companies were paranoid about who would sell enough hardware units, so they bet on all three horses. But only 3DO suffered from being unable to fund its business by setting fees too low. God bless America. Actually, no. Trip never said that last line. I just made that one up. 
Further on from this, Tripp goes on to state that it was idealism like this which was ultimately the Vredio's undoing. It is of note that unlike most other platforms of the time, the Freedio is completely region free, as Trips Hawkins believed in creating a product in which was as consumer friendly as possible. In reality though, region free consoles were of little interest to the industry, which was completely dominated by greedy Japanese corporations who favoured region lockouts and an incessant need for global control and the ability to fix prices. So by looking back at the 3DO's history, we can see that the system's success was somewhat hindered due to a series of unfortunate business blunders. But just because the system was not a success in 1993, does that mean that it isn't worth having a go of in 2018? Well, let me run through with you some of my experiences with the platform so far. Last year, I procured this beautiful complete inbox PAL European FZ1 model of the Panasonic 3DO. This system was all dandy and was working for my first few months of owning the system. However, sadly, one day it just cut out and completely died during a session of Street Fighter and would sadly never turn on again. I was absolutely raging at the time, as I spent good hard earned money on the product, and every 3DO left in my country appeared to be in the hands of dirty eBay scalpers, who were attempting to sell the system at prices so astronomical, it wasn't even plausible that anyone was ever going to buy them. After a few months of shopping around, I gave up on the UK and instead opted to import the platform from Japan, this time opting for the newer, more robust FZ10 model of the system instead, which also came in box. The next barrier to the 3DO's enjoyment was getting the system to work using a UK power supply, whilst preventing the little bugger from blowing up. You see, when importing games from places like Japan in the Orient and the USA in the old British colonies, you may have to take into account their pathetically inferior voltage systems. Voltage in the USA is only 110, whilst in Japan they have an even more embarrassing 100. So therefore I had to procure a Japanese power transformer so that I could run the system using the glorious British 240. Now we're playing with power. After this massive kerfuffle, I finally had everything I needed to play the 3DO once again. Well, everything except one thing, and that was a massive library of games. The best feature the 3DO has is that the system offers absolutely no copy protection. So you can simply go online and burn off copies of any of the 280 plus games on the system. Piracy, yeah. Or should I use Trip Hawkins' word? Idealism, yeah. I have had so much fun with the system since I've been able to make copies of the game. In fact, I've had so much fun playing 3DO games that I even done a six hour straight live stream the other night consistent of me just playing 3DO games. If you fancy coming to chat to me, join me at 9pm GNT on Saturday nights over on my Twitch channel, which can be found at twitch.tv slash chat. Come give me a follow and we can chat all bloody evening if you like. It's good fun, you will not regret it. Moving on from the cheeky plug, Let's begin now to actually talk about the 3DO's games themselves. Let's start off with a really strong entry and many people's favourite game on the 3DO platform. Road Rash, a great little gem of a racing game where you get to kick your opponents as you race around each track. A fun game with tons of 90s cheese. The full motion video cutscenes are particularly on the radical side of things. Speaking of full motion video games, the 3DO also features a version of the cult classic FMV game known as Night Trap. Apparently the 3DO version of Night Trap is vastly superior to its Sega Mega CD counterpart. 
However, I can neither confirm or deny this due to the fact that I have never played the Sega version. What I can confirm for you all though is that Night Trap is, uh, well, terrible. The most enjoyment I managed to obtain from the game was simply laughing at cheesy acting and the over the top out of place music. How on earth did this game manage to sell out so fast with the PS4 re-release by limited run? Who wanted to pay a premium to procure this shite? Probably just scalping twats. From one full motion video game to the next, another dual Mega CD slash 3DO release was Sewer Shark. This game underwhelmed me too, however I did find the visuals quite stimulating. The game kind of reminds me of Star Wars where Luke flies his X-Wing down the Death Star Trench. Thinking about it, the game itself looks stunning, and I would be more than happy to see games that look like this being released today. The gameplay doesn't really hold up though, so the aesthetics are the main novelty with this one. Next up we have Toad the Clips. I think once again we have to take into account how old this game is. It is a pretty visually stunning 3D game for the period. I found the controls on the other hand though to be particularly junky, however I can find myself becoming used to them over time. But then again does a game even deserve your playtime if you have to get used to the controls? I'll let you answer that one within my comment section. Samurai Showdown is a Neo Geo port and a half decent game within the fighting genre. I liked the 2D cartoony art style of this one and had some fun playing. If you like your fighters, I suppose this one is worth giving a go. However, I am no expert in this genre, so I am not going to analyse this game in any more depth. Speaking of fighters, the 3DO, like many systems, has its own version of Street Fighter 2. The 3DO version, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, was the definitive home console version of the game for quite some time. If you played the Super Nintendo or Mega Drive version of Super Street Fighter 2, then played a 3DO's offering, you will feel a world of difference. This version features an enhanced CD soundtrack and just feels and plays more fluid than its 16-bit counterparts. The only drawback I experienced with this version was the lack of background scrolling. However, I feel that can be overlooked when you take all the other advantages into consideration. Give this game a go as soon as you can. From one game on every platform to another, Wolfenstein is another well-known game that saw a release on the 3DO. Once again, this is a really solid port and I was thoroughly impressed with this game's quality. The 3DO feels like a great platform to kill Nazis in your spare time on. After experiencing the greatness of this game, I was fully expecting my top hat to be blown off once again by Doom. Doom on the other hand was a different kettle of fish altogether. If you were expecting this port of Doom to be any good, then frankly you are, well, doomed to excuse the terrible pun. I couldn't believe how terrible this version was, especially when you consider that the 3DO is a powerful 32-bit system, the frame rate is disgustingly bad and you do not even get to play the game in full screen and instead play the game in a small box within the screen instead. This game is a complete joke! Re! Speaking of jokes, you cannot talk about the 3DO without mentioning plumbers don't wear ties. Yes, it's bad. Yes, it is talked about too much now. But despite all of this, this game has to be experienced. This odd dating sim slash uh, visual novel may legitimately be the worst game I have ever played. The odd thing is though, it is so bad, you will end up having fun as you will end up rolling around on the floor in fits of laughter at this game's terribleness. Is Plumbers Don't Wear Ties so bad it's actually gone full circle and become good? Let me know in the comments section. Next up, Killing Time. I never put a great amount of time into this game as I just kept running out of bloody ammo all the time. I am sure there is much more to it, but I just kind of used this game as a duck massacring simulator. One assumes this is not the aim of the game, however it was fun nonetheless. Want to shoot stationary ducks? Then Killing Time is the game for you! Another game I've experienced for the first time whilst playing the 3DO was Gex. Gex is a franchise I have always previously snubbed based on how bad Gex 64 was. 
I tended to do the same thing for a while with Castlevania as well, due to the fact that I discovered the franchise on the Nintendo 64. With the NES and Super Nintendo entries not being too popular in the UK. Anyway, enough rambling, Gex is a strong platformer with a strong visual look, similar to that of the Donkey Kong Country series. Gex is one of the best 2D side scrollers on the platform, although there are not too many on there to begin with. Another decent side scroller on the platform is Soccer Kid, which got ported over to the system from the Amiga. Again, a really decent game, and I found the use of the football to be particularly interesting. Once again, the art style in this one is interesting too. The character sprites seem to look like they were mostly taken straight out of the Viz comic, which is nice. The 3DO gave me my first experience with Star Wars Rebel Assault, which to be fair, isn't a bad game at all. The game features very interesting graphical aesthetics that simply reek of early 90s 3D gaming. The game soundtrack is great too, due to the simple reason that most of it seems to be ripped straight from the original Star Wars trilogy. The game in my opinion has that epic Star Wars pre-prequel trilogy feel to it. Back in the days when the franchise was pure and any game was the closest visual medium, we got to a new Star Wars movie. Ah, magical times. Right, now I can tell you I have missed out a ton of major games for the system which I could have included in this video. However, as I have recently only just procured this system, I am slowly working my way through all of the major titles the platform has to offer. Maybe I'll cobble together another 3DO video down the line. Anyway, from the abundance of games I've experienced so far, I will conclude that the system is certainly rough around the edges, but there is also enough decent games on the system to amuse someone for quite some time. The 3DO with its eclectic mix of titles just has that odd forbidden 90s feeling to it. Playing games on this thing just feels so wrong but so right at the same time. Like you were playing something slightly niche and mysterious. It brings you back to the time of the early 90s, back to the time of there being so many different consoles around that gaming almost had an air of mystery around it and about what was actually available to play. The Panasonic 3DO encapsulates that feeling of the unknown absolutely perfectly. So, is the 3DO worth playing today? Hell bloody yes! Whether you want to play for curiosity, want a cheap laugh, want to play some quality games, or want to further expand your gaming historical knowledge, the 3DO has a little bit of something for everyone. Sure, the platform isn't the best games console of all time, but it certainly isn't the worst of all time either. So give the 3DO a chance, and maybe it'll be worth your time. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the Panasonic 3DO. Have you got much experience with the platform? Does this video give you any temptation to pick the system up? Which games intrigue you the most? And which games should I talk about next? Let me know in the comment section as I would be eager to know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And if you fancy a chat, I am live on twitch.tv slash chat every single Saturday night from 9pm GMT. Shoutouts to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Victor Rain, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Agnes Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Law Reloaded, Diego Pereira dos Santos Silva, and all of my other patrons. Combined, you all help me find the motivation to continue to churn out regular content. Every little helps. Did I just steal that catchphrase? Uh, anyway, it's mine now. So yes, come support me on Patreon. That should be great. Yeah. Cheerio.